OK, so we agree they're both good singers, but what would they be like to be in a band with? Lucia, what do you think? I thought Layla was really nice. She had good body language. She seemed relaxed and friendly, but also confident without being overconfident. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I like the way she really listened to us. You know, she made eye contact, and she asked questions when she didn't understand something. Also, she had a very positive attitude. She said lots of nice things about her friends and the band she's in now. And she wasn't looking at her phone all the time. In fact, I didn't even see it. She was late, though. You know how I feel about people being on time for rehearsals. True, but she explained why and she apologised, so I think that's okay. So what about Stefan? He has a great voice. Yeah, didn't he seem too confident to you? He interrupted us lots of times when we were talking about the band so he could tell us about himself. I imagine he's quite selfish. I didn't like the way he talked about his last band. He was really rude about them, and he spoke so fast sometimes it was hard to understand him. Did you notice how he never smiled and almost never made eye contact? I didn't think his body language was very positive. And did you see him checking his phone when I was talking to him? Like he didn't really want to be here. Yeah, I noticed that. But, as Ezra said, great voice. His clothes were nice too. Very cool. And... Guess what? Aiden's left home. What? No way! It's true. He told me his mum had accused him of stealing money. He denied it, but his stepfather threatened to kick him out, so he's staying at Ben's. Poor Aiden. Uh, that reminds me, it's Laura's birthday party on Friday. I know Ben's going. What about you? Yes, I think so. Anyway, as I was saying, Aiden had to leave home. He admitted that he wants to go back. What did you say? I persuaded him to call his mom and explain how he feels. I'll talk to him again at school. Speaking of school, I should go or I'll be late. Hey, Elise. You'll never believe what I'm doing this Saturday. Surprise me. One of my teachers recommended going to a recruitment day. I asked my parents what they thought and they encouraged me to go. That's great, Mila. Oh, by the way, did you get Miss Lewis's message about the class meeting? It starts at 4pm this week, and she reminded everyone to be on time. Right, thanks for telling me. So, back to what I was saying, Mr Walker advised me to dress smartly and not to wear my old jeans. And warned you not to talk too much, I expect. <laughs> anyway, before I forget, can I borrow your leather briefcase? I want to make a good impression. Did you and Adam go to that new cafe at the weekend? How was it? Yes, it was great. As you know, I'm a big fan of meat, so I wasn't sure if I'd like it or not. Is it all meat-free then? Yes, but there are plenty of choices, like interesting things with pasta. So what did you have? Well, Adam was going to have the fish soup. We both thought it looked amazing, but then he saw the salad I'd ordered and he changed his mind and had the same as me. Hmm, I think the fish soup sounds good and much healthier than meat. Yes, maybe I'll try it next time. We're very lucky to have with us this evening an amazing star of both TV and film. 
We probably all know her best for playing the character of the talented artist Emma in the TV series Picture Me. It was certainly one of the most popular programs on TV in recent years. The whole country was talking about it. But this evening, we're going to find out about her career change into writing. Her latest novel was published earlier this year, and I'm sure it's going to be as successful as her TV career has been. Please join me in welcoming author and actor, Teresa Corrales. Hi, Ben. Hi. Oh, no. What have you done to your leg? Did you have an accident? Yes. I cycled to the coast one day last week. The weather was really sunny when I arrived, so I decided to go for a swim. I left my bike on the road and walked down to the beach, but I didn't notice a hole in the sand as I was walking. I wasn't in the water for very long because the wind suddenly got really strong. There were some huge waves and it was difficult to stand up. It was on the way back that I fell into the hole. If only I'd seen it before. I couldn't ride my bike home, so my mum had to collect me in the car. Tom, it's me. Listen, I'm sorry, but I can't meet you this Saturday as usual for tennis. I have to go away with my family. You see, my aunt is in hospital... She had a sore throat and a fever last week, but it got much worse and she couldn't stay at home on her own. So my mum and dad are going over to visit her for a couple of days. I'm going to help them by cleaning my aunt's house and doing the shopping while they visit her in hospital. I hope we can play tennis next weekend, though. Shall we go and see something at the cinema next week? There are some really good movies on. That's a great idea. There's the next part of that story about the family who travel into the future. The first one was amazing. I'm with you on that. I loved it too. So which day shall we go? Hmm, let me see. Well, next Monday is the 1st of April, but I can't go then because I've got a music lesson. How about the Wednesday? So that's the third, isn't it? Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Can you go the day before, on the second? You mean the Tuesday? Yes, that sounds good. Sorted. See you next week, then. Buying and selling between countries is called trade, right? Yes, in some countries, there are companies that manufacture goods like phones or coffee. Those companies are the producers, and people in other countries want to buy those things. And these people are consumers? Correct. So the companies send their products abroad. In other words, they export them. And the countries, or the importers that buy them, are the markets. Exactly. And the price they have to pay for something depends on two things. Firstly, how many people want to buy it, the demand, and secondly, how much of it is available for sale, the supply. Also, more people are using online retailers like Amazon. Many of their products are cheaper because they have huge buildings where they keep their stock and items are distributed around the country by lorry. I'd really like to start a business baking and selling cakes at school. Great idea, but you ought to talk to the head teacher first. You mustn't start a business at school without permission. Will anybody buy them, though? Of course. You needn't worry about that. Everyone likes cake. What about advertising? Yes, you definitely need to advertise. But remember, you don't have to sell cakes every day. 
You should start with just one cake sale a week. The cakes have to be good. Yes, and you have to make sure you follow the rules about health and safety. I'm not sure I can do this. Of course you can. You must believe in yourself. We all know we should recycle our waste, but do we really know what happens to it? Today we're looking at the global trade in waste, especially plastic waste. Recycling is a business, and waste material is a resource. Companies make money from selling it to different markets abroad. There are also economic benefits for their customers, the companies in those markets who recycle it. All kinds of waste are exported, including paper, cardboard, glass, and metals. But plastic is the one that contributes most to environmental pollution. Plastic makes up 12% of all global waste, but only about 9% of plastic waste is recycled. Over the past 30 years, there has been a huge growth in the export of plastic waste from the UK, the US, Japan, and the EU. In 2016, 14 million tons were exported for recycling. Over half of this, 7.35 million tons, went to China. China recycled the waste and manufactured new products from it. However, in 2018, this situation changed when China introduced a ban on the import of most plastic waste. As a consequence, exporters had to send their waste somewhere else, mainly to countries in Southeast Asia like Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines. The problem is, there's now too much plastic waste for these countries to deal with, and not all types of plastic can be recycled, for example, plastic bags. It's prohibited to export non-recyclable waste from the EU. Companies know they mustn't do it, but it still happens. The main effect is that a lot of plastic is not recycled. It's thrown away and eventually ends up in the ocean. About 8 million tonnes enters the ocean every year. Secondly, some countries have realised they don't have to deal with this material. Some countries, like Malaysia, are starting to return it. And Thailand and Indonesia have raised their environmental standards and also introduced bans on some plastic waste. So what happens if we can't send our waste abroad to be recycled? One solution is to produce less plastic. Increasing numbers of consumers are demanding more environmentally friendly packaging and that may influence the way companies package their goods. Of course, environmentalists argue that we needn't export waste at all. We just have to get better at recycling it at home. That means the international recycling industry needs to invest more money in better recycling methods that are less polluting. But one thing is certain, we must find a solution soon. Did you listen to the podcast by Kate Martin about global consumers? It has really inspired me to change what I buy and to get other people to do the same. No, I didn't hear it. What did she say? Basically, there are three things everyone can do. Firstly, we can reduce the number of things we buy. So, for example, buy fewer but better quality clothes and wear them more. Mm, sounds good. Or we could buy one good quality fair trade chocolate bar instead of several cheaper ones, so it needn't actually cost more. Yes, I hadn't thought of that. So what was the second thing we can do? OK, secondly, 
Kate also said we should try to recycle as much as possible. For example, buy second-hand clothes or swap clothes you don't need with friends. You can do this with books, computer games, music, bikes and skateboards too. I like that. Maybe we could organise a swapping event at school for all the old things we don't want anymore. Good idea. Thanks. So, what was the third thing we can do? It was to reuse the things we buy. Don't buy something because it's cheap and then throw it away. Buy things that last a long time and look after them. OK, so at school students could use their own cup or mug at the cafe or their own water bottle? Exactly. And we could also ask the canteen to serve more plant-based meals like meat-free burgers and give people the chance to be more environmentally friendly. That all sounds really good, but how do we get other students interested in changing what they buy? <laughs> that isn't going to be easy. We need to get them to come up with their own ideas. If we just tell them what they ought to do, they won't do it. OK then, let's ask people to message us with their ideas. I need some advice about money. My mum makes a payment into my bank account every month. The problem is, I usually spend it in two weeks. What's the best thing to do if I want to reduce my spending? Your best option is to withdraw a small amount of cash each week. Only buy what you really need and don't take out any more until the following week. OK. Uh, that makes sense. Also, it would be a good idea if you kept a note of everything you spend. That way you'll soon find out where your money is going. I need a new laptop, but the one I want is really expensive. How do you think I ought to pay for that? Does it have to be new? Have you thought about getting a second-hand one? Mm, what about getting a loan? You could do that, but if I were you, I'd try not to get into debt. I have some important exams this year, and I'm a bit worried. OK. How can I help? I spend most of my time studying the subjects I like, and then don't have enough time for the others. What do you advise me to do? Well, you need to organise your study time better. You're right. But how do you think I should do that? First, have you tried making a study plan? Every week you'll need to write down the subjects you have to study and decide how much time to spend on each. Thanks. That's really helpful. What about writing essays? I always leave it to the night before. Well, again, you really ought to think about making a plan. Think about how long you need for your reading and note-taking, not just the writing. And you'd better start early. Don't wait until the last minute. Could you find the time to give me a hand this evening? Let me guess. You want me to help you paint the basement? How did you know? I heard Dad ask you earlier. Did he offer to pay you? <laughs> Fat chance of that. No, but he gave me money for the stuff we needed. Did you get everything? Yes, ta-da! One can of paint and two brushes. OK, then. Let's get on with it. It has a kitchen, a living room and a bedroom plus a tiny bathroom, which is all you need. There's a solar panel on the roof, which I suppose supplies the electricity for all the appliances. What's great about living there is that it looks perfect for one person. I also like the fact that you're close to nature. You can look outside and see trees and birds. 
And if you get tired of where you are, you can just move somewhere else. Of course, there must be disadvantages. For one thing, it's quite small, which could be a problem when the weather's bad and you can't go outside. The cupboards and shelves are functional. However, there isn't much space to store stuff. Keeping warm and dry in winter could be difficult. You'd have to wear lots of sweaters and a hat to feel cosy. One of the biggest advantages of living there is that it's designed to be eco-friendly. The house uses modern, sustainable technology, which doesn't take up a lot of space. There are solar panels on the roof, so it's completely self-sufficient in terms of energy. This means it costs very little to run the electrical appliances. There are also plenty of cupboards and two built-in wardrobes to store things. The air inside is very clean and the house is very quiet but seems to be a long way from other houses. Maybe it would be better if it was closer to town. I think I'd feel lonely without neighbors I could talk to. Also, you would have to use a car every time you wanted to go shopping, which isn't very eco-friendly. What makes living on the 30th floor so special? Well, when you look at these breathtaking views of the city, you can see that the apartment was carefully designed. It isn't very big, but it seems really spacious because there are so many windows. I think it's probably quite cool in summer, so you would rarely need the air conditioning. It's a long way above the city, so I imagine it's quite peaceful, except when it's windy. Then it could be really noisy. And I've read that these buildings actually move in the wind. That's quite scary. One obvious problem is that it's a long way down to the basement, where there are washing machines and other appliances for residents to use. Also, what if you don't get on with your neighbors, or they play loud music? That could be a problem. This place is unique. Looking at the pictures, you can see that it's like a block of flats, but under the ground. I suppose it must be somewhere people could live if there was a disaster, like a global pandemic or as a result of climate change. There are 15 floors which go down 60 metres. There are spacious apartments with furniture and modern appliances, and up to 75 people can live there. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that it's completely self-sufficient. It makes its own electricity and air supply. There's a supermarket, a library, a gym, everything you need, really. However, there's no natural light and no fresh air. There are video screens instead of windows, so you can imagine you're looking outside, but it's not the same. I'm a bit worried that the people who live there might feel a bit sad. I think you'd need a positive attitude. So, Will, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Where should I start? I'm 21 years old and I'm studying at Bath University. I spent a year travelling and working before I went to university, so I'm quite independent. I like being outdoors, especially surfing with my friends. Why are you interested in house-sitting? Well, let's put it this way. My flatmate is going home for the summer and I can't afford to pay the rent on my own. <laughs> house-sitting would solve that problem. I see. Have you done any house-sitting before? I looked after my parents' house for a month last Christmas while they were away. I mean, it isn't exactly the same, but I did okay. I'm glad to hear it. And are you happy to keep the house clean and tidy? Yes, I don't mind cleaning at all. 
That's good. So, are there any jobs you can't stand? Well, cooking, I guess. How shall I put it? It's not my favourite thing to do. What do you like doing at weekends? How often do you go out partying? Hardly ever. The thing is, I don't go out much, except to go surfing. What else? Let me think. I like music and playing computer games. What do you think your friends would say about you? That's a good question. It depends who you ask, but I think they'd say I was hardworking and reliable, but maybe not very sociable. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm your tour guide today, and I'd like to show you around this beautiful house and its gardens. We'll start our tour inside the house, where I'll tell you about its past and the people who lived here. Then we'll go into the garden and look at its many old trees. But first, let me give you a short introduction. Kelmscott Manor is a very important house which was built around 450 years ago. Now, it's such a spectacular building that you might think it was built by a famous architect. In fact, it was actually built by a local man called Thomas Turner, and it stayed in his family for many generations. But in 1734, after the death of George Turner, the last person in the family to own the house, the house was rented to other people. It wasn't until nearly a hundred years later that it became the home of the famous writer and designer William Morris. <laughs> I'm sure many of you will be aware of his connection with art in 19th century Britain. William Morris was a great fan of traditional British arts. <laughs> But did you also know that Morris was deeply interested in the environment? Mm. In fact, some people now say that he could almost see into the future because even back then, he was worried about a climate crisis. Oh, wow. oh, yeah. <laughs> now, when we go inside the house, we will, of course, see many of Morris's famous designs. We'll also see some of his furniture. And in his bedroom, there are many of his original books. In addition, there is a wonderful collection of paintings by well-known artists. You may be interested to know that this house appears in the background of a painting of Morris's wife, painted by the famous artist Rossetti in 1871. Oh, I like his stuff. Mm. The house also features in Morris's novel News from Nowhere, which he wrote in 1890. It's an unusual kind of science fiction story about a man who travels forward in time into the 21st century. <laughs> well, Morris died in 1896, but his wife continued living here and bought the house 17 years later. When their daughter died in 1938, she left it to Oxford University. She wanted the university to take care of all the wonderful things inside the house and for it to be open for people to visit. I'll tell you more about that later, but now let's just wander this way. Alice, UNICEF recently published a report about Internet access around the world. What does it say? Well, according to the report, 3.7 billion people don't have access to the Internet, and 1.3 billion young people aged 3 to 17 years old have no internet connection at home. That's around 65% of the world's school-age children. This results in something called the digital divide, the difference in educational opportunities between students who have internet access and those who don't. Not only does it limit young people's ability to connect with each other online, but it also prevents them from connecting with the wider world 
and taking part in the 21st century economy. Most importantly, it has an impact on their education. The recent COVID-19 pandemic led to schools around the world closing. Millions of students had to depend on online learning to continue their education, but young people with no access to the internet couldn't do that. They lost months of their education. So what are the reasons for this digital divide? The report says that globally, almost 90% of school-aged children in rich countries have an internet connection at home. But in the poorest countries, this can be as low as 5%. On average, in countries across the world, 58% of children from the richest families have internet access at home. That's compared with only 16% from the poorest households. The situation is usually worse in the countryside because it's more expensive to provide internet access there. Also, people are often poorer. Worldwide, less than 25% of young people living in the countryside have internet access at home. And even when there is a connection at home, some families may not let children use it because of the cost. Children may not have their own devices or understand how to log into online learning platforms. But it isn't all bad news, is it? No, not at all. UNICEF has recently set up a global project called GIGA, which is aimed at connecting every school and its local community to the internet. Starting with schools, GIGA is finding out where there is a need for better internet connections across the world. This allows countries to review their current internet networks and decide how to improve them. It's already succeeded in identifying over 800,000 schools in 30 countries. Now it's using the data to work with technical companies to provide schools and communities with internet connections. For example, in one West African country, 40% of people have no internet connection. Almost 45% can't afford internet access or don't know how to use it. Giga is working with the government on improving internet access. This includes persuading richer countries and private companies who specialise in technology to invest in the project. So in future, I think millions more children across the world will benefit from the opportunities provided by online education. Well, that's got to be good news for all of us. So the first thing I'd like to say is I disagree with the statement. I'm absolutely convinced that exams are the best and fairest way to measure students' progress. That may have been true once, but it isn't true anymore. There are two points I'd like to mention. First of all, sitting exams is extremely stressful for many students. Secondly, exams don't actually measure what you've learned about a subject. They just show how good you are at learning to pass exams. That's a good point. But exams aren't only about testing what you know. They also help you to understand about success in the real world. I'm not with you. Let me put it another way. I think if you have to pass an exam to get to university or gain a qualification, it makes you try harder. Exams make you more competitive. And there's no doubt that life is a competition. That's fairly obvious. You may be right, but I don't think you need to fail an exam to understand that. The point of education is to discover new things and enjoy learning. 
And besides, there are definitely better ways to measure progress than testing. How do you mean? What I mean is the best person to decide what grades you should get is your teacher. Why not have a system where teachers give students grades based on the coursework they've done over the year? I'm not saying coursework isn't important. It certainly is important. But we should think carefully about what's fair too. It's true to say that if everyone does the same exam at the same time, they'll all have an equal chance of succeeding. You can't argue with that. Get that job. Don't forget to review the job description so you know what the company is looking for. Whether you are asked to complete an application form or send an up-to-date CV, make sure that it contains the right information. It's important to show you have all the necessary qualifications for the job. Also, try to include some information about you, a travel experience or an interesting hobby. This can help you to stand out from the other candidates. If they decide to interview you, arrive early and tell the receptionist that you have an appointment. The interviewers will ask you about your education and work experience. They might also ask some random questions to see how you respond. If the company wants to hire you, they will probably contact your previous employers in order to get a reference. A job advertisement will usually include information about money, but it's a good idea to check the monthly salary before you accept a job. So, let's talk about job interviews. The big question is, how do you succeed in an interview? Well, the key thing is preparation. And how do we do this? Use the internet. Exactly. First, go online and find out as much as you can about the company. For example, what it does, because some candidates don't bother to find out. And any news articles about it on social media. Why is research important? It shows the interviewers that you're interested in them, whereas they won't be impressed by someone who's done no research. And although you can't find out everything, it will help you stand out against other candidates. Now, let's think. What else is important? You need to review the job description carefully. Yes, good point. It's important to be clear how your skills and qualifications match the job you're applying for, since this shows you understand the role. Think about obvious questions, such as what do you know about the company and why do you want the job? OK, so we've read the job description and imagined what questions they'll ask us. Right. So next, you need to plan your answers, but also be ready for random questions because some employers like to surprise candidates. Also, prepare some questions of your own to ask at the end of the interview. Is it a good idea to practice? Definitely. If possible, before the interview, practice with someone like a friend or your mum or dad. OK, how about the day of the interview? When should you arrive? On time. Actually, you should try to arrive early for your interview so you aren't stressed. And then you have time to think about what to say, right? Exactly. Then once you're in the room, you should think about your body language. So, for example, shake hands firmly at the start and remember to look at the person who's speaking. Is it OK to smile? Sure. Good eye contact and some smiling shows you're interested and paying attention. Listen carefully to each question and make sure you understand what the other person is asking. 
when you're ready to answer, avoid talking too much. Candidates often do this because they're nervous. And try to sound enthusiastic. Do you think it's possible to say too little? Definitely. If your answer is too short, this can also look bad. Practicing your answers before the interview can help you to avoid both these problems. So, we've talked about things we should do. What about things we shouldn't do? Good question. Never interrupt the interviewer. And never say anything negative about your current or previous employer, even though you may not like them. This could suggest you're a difficult person to work with or someone who complains a lot. What usually happens after the interviewer has finished asking their questions? After that, they usually ask if you have any questions. Always say yes. What if you can't think of any questions? You really should try and think of at least two questions. Even though you may not have prepared them, it really doesn't look good if you have nothing to say. What happens when someone phones the police to report a crime? For example, if they are calling to report a burglary at their house. We launch an investigation to gather more information. We try to find evidence which the criminal has left at the scene. Why is that important? Because you can't arrest someone without evidence or unless you have a good reason to believe they have broken the law or unless they confess to a crime, which is very unusual. OK. So what happens next? Usually we'll try to find witnesses who may have seen something important. Then we interview them. We need information which helps us to identify suspects. Then you can arrest the suspects? Yes, if we're quite sure they committed the crime. As a shop assistant, you'll often need to communicate with someone who wants help or someone who isn't happy and wants to complain. Good communication skills are important. When you are dealing with a customer, be friendly and always be polite. You want them to know that you are there to help them. That means you have to listen carefully to what they say. Make eye contact and nod your head to show them you're listening. Ask questions to get clarification or more information but try not to interrupt them. It also helps to be flexible. You may start off thinking one thing, but after hearing everything the other person says, it may be necessary to change your mind. That's easier if you have an open mind. Showing empathy is also important. Try to imagine how the customer is feeling, especially if they have a complaint. This will tell them that you understand them. If you treat the other person with respect, they'll know that you are taking them seriously. That's important, even if you don't agree with what they are saying. When you talk to a customer, don't say too much. They want to know how you are going to solve their problem. They're not interested in your opinion or lots of detail about the action you plan to take. Get to the point quickly and explain clearly and simply what you can do for them. This photo shows a street with several people in it. In the middle, I can see a teenage girl and a policeman. They're standing on the pavement and there's a bicycle between them. The girl is wearing a jacket and a tie. Maybe it's a school uniform. The policeman is holding the bicycle with one hand and the girl is talking to him. On the left of the photo is a large old building with a black fence. It could be a museum or a public building. Further down the street, I can clearly see trees and it looks like there are houses too. Behind the girl and the policeman, there are two boys or 
Perhaps one of them is a man? I'm not sure. They're talking to each other. They aren't looking at the girl and the policeman. Behind them, a van is driving out of the building onto the road. The girl and the policeman seem to be arguing. She looks like she is upset about something. Judging by the fact that she is holding on to the seat of the bike, I think it's probably her bike. If I had to make a guess, I'd say the policeman has stopped her for committing a minor crime. Perhaps it's because she was riding on the pavement? Or maybe she didn't stop at a red light? The policeman has one hand on his radio. I suppose he's about to contact the police station. It's possible he thinks the girl has stolen the bike. Some people say that your school days are the best years of your life. I'm not sure if that's true for everyone, but I've had a great time. Of course, there's been some stress with all the studying and taking exams. I won't miss that at all. It'll be great to have more free time without all that homework. But there are lots of benefits to being at school. For a start, you don't really have to be responsible for anything important. I'm not sure I want to worry about leaving home and finding somewhere to live, and getting a job, of course. I find that the older I get, the closer I am to my parents. I've always got on really well with them, but now we also have more to talk about, you know, as adults. I'm an only child, so I don't have any brothers or sisters to hang out with, but these days I have a great time with my cousins. They're a few years older than me, but that doesn't matter now that we're teenagers. When we were children, the age difference was more important, and we didn't spend a lot of time together. Now, it's like they are my brothers and sisters. A few years ago, I didn't have a lot of confidence. I was quite shy and I didn't really have that many good friends. Maybe that was because I'm quite small. A lot of the other students in my class are bigger than me and they're good at sports, unlike me. But then we got a new teacher and she really encouraged me. She helped me to realise that not everyone is good at the same things and it doesn't matter. I may not be strong and fast, but I'm good at other subjects like English and history. I used to hate speaking in front of the class. Now, I don't mind at all. In fact, I quite enjoy it. I really love spending time with my friends, but I also find older people really interesting. They have so many great stories to tell. Whenever I see my granddad, he talks about his childhood and how things were different then. It's fascinating looking at all his old photos with him. Of course, he isn't so active these days, but he never complains. I can see from him that you appreciate different things as you get older, which is great. But my granddad says that you're never too old to learn new things, and I think that's true. I've even taught him how to use social media recently. Not everyone looks forward to leaving school, but personally, I can't wait. I really want to go to university and carry on studying, though. I'd love to go travelling for a few weeks, too, but of course you need money to do that. I'm really not interested in getting a job and earning money yet. There's plenty of time for that in the future, and there are too many other things to do in life. My older sister is already at college, and she loves it. Our brother, on the other hand, has just got a job. He seems to be enjoying it, but then he's got a very different personality from us. <laughs>